All right, we got a Raptor to save. You know, I'm actually trying to save quads here. Not like, I don't know if you guys saw what's going on in New York where they're actually collecting ATVs and dirt bikes off of the street. They're confiscating them and then just crushing them, which I think is absolutely ridiculous because I get that they want to get them off the street and stuff, but why wouldn't they at least part them out? You know, we're at a time right now where these things are, you know, disappearing in general, like they don't make them anymore and they're just going to crush them, which really pisses me off because first off, like I said, you could part them out and at least that way, People that are riding responsibly and everything, they could get parts for when their stuff breaks down. And the other thing that bothers me is I'm sure a number of those are stolen. So imagine having your bike stolen, some goon riding it around, and then it gets confiscated and crushed. So that just makes no sense to me. And uh, what really pisses me off is, you know, those people that are making the shot, that are calling the shots up there to do this stuff. They don't give a about anything unless it's going on in their, li their own living room. You think they care about ATVs and stuff? Definitely not. Anyways, rant over. The ASPCA Raptor has been sitting like this for way, way, way too long. Engine parts are laid out. We've got a ton of stuff out here, man. These cases look incredible. This stuff came back from Bonehead Performance. Oh, shit, man. This is why we, this is why we can't have nice things. I think we're all right, though. But check out the finish on this thing, man. These are from Bonehead Performance. So I don't know if they vapor blasted these or what, but the inside and outside of these cases Looks really, really good. Got these colored in what's called jet, uh, blackjack, which is like one of my favorite colors from them. All the covers are done. Dude, these things looked like shit before. It's amazing that they came up so nice. Check out this bronze color. I think the contrast between the bronze and the matte black is gonna look really, really good. Uh, these little covers and stuff are gonna go on here, have a nice contrast there. And oh, man, it's just gonna be freaking sweet. This is the head. Uh, this was compliments of PSN. They sent me the head, then I sent the head to Bonehead Performance, got it Cerakoted bronze, and I went ahead and ported this thing. Uh, you can't really see it. I'll post up some pictures, uh, but now that the valves are in there, you can't really see the work that I did on there. But where, where it was really restrictive, I mean, just the head in general, it's always good to port that and clean it up. But these boots were super restrictive. I had to open these up a lot. So I matched these up perfectly to the intakes and I opened them up a good bit. So we should get quite a bit more flow. Now, while these cases look beautiful and they are, they, they, they look great. We need to make sure that they have nice flat mating surfaces. So that's like one of the things I'm really big on. We could probably throw these together, throw some RTV on there and they might not leak, but especially given the condition of this Raptor when we got it, man, this thing's a total piece of crap and just uh, abused. It was totally abused. I definitely want to make sure that we put some extra work into these. And honestly, I like to do this to all of my engines before I put them together because why not? So what I want to do is surface them. That's a really easy task to do. And then we're also, I'm just going to go over all of the screws, uh, all of the threaded uh, areas, make sure that they're nice and clean. When you get stuff back from sand blasting, any kind of media, media blasting, sometimes sand gets in the, uh, the threads and it makes it so that when you thread in bolts and stuff, it's really gritty. Sometimes they seize up. Sometimes you, you can sh strip them out. It's just really easy to run over all of them, do that stuff now so that when it comes time to assemble, it's really easy. Now, surfacing your engine cases is actually really easy. And I think the reason that most people don't do it is because most people don't have a surfacing stone. I mean, shit, I didn't have one until maybe six months ago. I tried using a regular piece of granite, which is actually right here, and that worked for a little bit of time. But these are not 100% flat, and I got lucky with this one, but even that one's not perfectly flat. An actual surfacing stone like this one right here can be really expensive between the stone itself and the table that it's on. It's around 500 bucks. Plus it's big, it's cumbersome, and it's just like one of those things, how frequently are normal people using it? So most people don't have this stuff. But if you do have it, it's really, really easy. You literally just put your case on here and you just gyrate it around. You can check the back and see if you have any low spots, stuff like that. It's really the only way to make sure these case halves are completely flat. Now, people ask me every time what grit sandpaper I use when I do this. This is just regular 220 wet dry sandpaper. That's what I use, it's what I've always used, and my engines almost never leak. So, <laughs> that's what I use. So we'll make sure there's no dowels or anything back here, anything that would hold this from resting flat. Looks like we're good to go. And you don't push down on this either when you're doing it. Just kind of want to glide it using the actual weight of the cover and it'll get the job done. We're not taking a lot off here. If you see a ton of low spots, you might have to get a new case or, you know, there's always the RTV alternative to fill in the gaps. So after you spin it around a couple times, you can flip it over and see what it's doing. If you look around the edges, you can see 
areas that it's touching and not touching. So there's a couple low spots on this. See right here is a low spot. But for the most part, this is actually pretty good. So I'm gonna give this a couple more passes and then I'll do all the other engine cases as well. And as you're doing this, you'll get this kind of white powder buildup and you wanna keep that clean as you're doing your case. So every surface that I do, I go over with the vacuum with the brush and just gently uh, go over it with this on and it'll clean it out. If you don't do that, you'll get clumps and stuff and the sandpaper is basically ruined and your perfectly flat surface is shot. So keep it clean and the sandpaper should last you a long time. Well, about four hours later and we're all surfaced up. These are all good to go. They look way better than before. Uh, the reason it took so long is because this cylinder actually needed quite a bit of work on the top, but the, the thing that held me up the most was this bastard right here that had a bolt that was stuck in there. Big surprise. Everything on this quad, there's, I don't know, like there had to be like 60 broken bolts on the ASPCA Raptor, but uh, there was a broken easy out in there, which is like impossible to drill. And uh, that may have been my fault. So uh, boring one of those out with a, you know, going back and forth between a Dremel and uh, just cutting bits and uh, slowly getting through there just literally took like two hours. So it's all good now though. Time consumption, man. Sometimes that's the name of the game with these things. It's like, who's got more patience? The ASPCA Raptor or me? Probably the Raptor because it's an inanimate object. But anyways, uh, I wanna surface these. That's the last thing I wanna do. I figured I'd just uh, show you guys how to do that because you can't do these individually, then they wouldn't be even. So we're gonna mate these cases up and then we'll surface it. Some cases you can't. Raptor 660 you can because there's uh, nothing sticking up. But sometimes there's like, you know, something sticking up here or sticking up here, and then it's a little more difficult. You can get like a flat plate and put sandpaper on and do it. But in this case, we'll be all right. I got two fresh dowel pins. I'm gonna throw these in place. One in the front and one in the back. Pop our cases together. The dowel pins are really important to do this because that's what keeps everything lined up which that's really the whole purpose of putting these together to make this flat. And then I'm just gonna throw in two bolts, one in the front and one in the back, and we'll snug it down. There we go. Now these are one unit. I can go ahead and flatten that out. And you can see they're not quite perfect the way they sit. Now this can be a little more tedious because you've got more weight on the one side. Naturally with any piece it's gonna be that way, but you might wanna just uh, kinda of give a little bit more pressure on this side, and this side maybe just let the, the weight of the cases do the work. And it's gonna be just like the other pieces. Oh yeah, this, this needed it pretty bad. You can see on these cases where it's contacting, right here, and right here, a little bit back here, this one side is clearly a bit higher than the other one. That's what we don't want. There's like a slight little lip here. You can see the transition. We wanna make sure that's nice and smooth. And I noticed the color of these cases is slightly different. So it is possible that these are mismatched. That's uh, one of those things where you definitely need to be surfacing everything because if they came from two different machines, that's really when you get issues. So I'm gonna go ahead and finish this off. All right, we are completely surfaced, and now it is time to do the next unfun pre-engine assembly. Assembly. And uh, we're gonna load this thing up with the bearings. So I'm gonna use the old hot and cold method. We'll put the cases in the oven, and that will excite the aluminum molecules and open everything up just a little bit. It'll expand, and we're gonna put the bearings in the freezer. That'll tighten the, the uh, bearing races up a little bit. And sometimes the bearings just drop right into place. And even if they don't, it makes tapping them into place way, way easier or pressing them however you're deciding to do it. But usually if you get these nice and warm and the bearings really cold, they just pop, they'll, they'll, they'll tap right into place. Real quick before I put these in the oven though, I'm gonna run a thread chase in all of my threaded poles. And what that's gonna do is clean out any gunk or anything. It has these little channels in here and it'll actually collect the gunk in there. And sometimes it'll It'll spit out as you're doing it. You just wanna make sure you don't cross thread this. It's just nice and easy. 
A lot of them are going to be just fine. But sometimes you get gasket material and stuff that's stuck in there. And this will pull it out. It's as easy as that. I don't know if you guys can see, but there's grit stuck in there. So you got to keep cleaning this tool and then take your air. And just make sure it's good and clean in there, believe me. Going around and doing this to all of your bolt holes before you build the engine, it's gonna save you a lot of time. All right, so the threads are all cleaned out. We had a couple bad ones, these ones down low especially. Some of them were filled with RTV from the last guy who caked it on there. Uh, so we cleaned them all out. I did find two stripped holes. There's one right here and one down here. And right now, I am out of time certs and helicoil, so I just ordered some of them, but that's okay. We can go ahead and put the bearings in here and actually do the entire bottom end, and I can repair those two afterwards before I put the side cover on. So I might as well keep going forward. I'm gonna go ahead and throw these in the oven and get these ready to put the bearings in. And for those wondering, I heat these up at 225. Man, I'll tell you what, the ASPCA Raptor is just the gift that keeps on giving. Yet again, another broken bolt. I don't know how I missed that. That's where the pickup goes. The stator goes in the middle here and then the little pickup bolts up there. Yeah, man, another snapped bolt. Just, what the f Can we get it out with the easy out? I think it might be moving. Nope. No, it's not. Whew. Just got through the bolt finally. Well, I can see why the person left that bolt in there because that was a major pain in the ass. But mission accomplished. We have got a perfect bolt hole now. Managed to save all the threads, and uh, I would say that we're good to go. Whew. All right, we got our freshly baked cases and some ice cold bearings. Now with luck, these will drop right into place, but just in case, we can tap them in place too. That one dropped right in. Right in. Yeah, let's see if we can do this one just as easy. We've got our counter shaft bearing. Oh, that was perfect, dude. That's, that's what you want. <laughs> Slides right in. That's what she said. Oh, yes, perfect. We've got a shielded bearing, goes here. And I think that's it as far as bearings. The crank bearing goes in with the crank on this side. While we're here, we'll put our bearing retainers in place. We've got some brand new hardware because the old ones got stripped out pretty bad. We put just a little bit of blue Loctite on these. Oh man, the cases are still hot. And we'll use a JIS screwdriver, thread these in place. And the last thing I want to do is put my seals in place. Pack the inner lips with grease before, damn it. Pack the inner leap, ugh. pack the inner lips with grease. And most of these just press in by finger. Amazingly, we've got all the cases good to go. They're all surface, they all fit together and everything, and they're populated with bearings. There's only one mistake I made, and that was with this one counter shaft bearing here. There's actually a seal that goes on the inside before the bearing goes in. I don't know if you guys will be able to see it, um, but it's a seal, it goes underneath and I forgot it. And in the service manual, it's not really, it's not really indicated very well, it, even at all. You know, I kind of was like, there's an extra seal in my seal kit. I'm like, I know this goes someplace. Figured out where it went and then I, re I looked back in the service manual and it's really, at least the, the, uh, the climber service manual is the one I'm using. I know a lot of people don't like these, uh, the OEM ones they say are better, but I mean, I've never really had a problem with these, but in this case, they definitely don't indicate that one. So if you do replace the counter shaft bearing, make sure you do the seal as well. And then on the back side of the clutch cover, there's a seal that goes right here too. So you gotta make sure you replace that. It's actually pretty important too. 
I believe that goes on the end of the crank and then uh, that will maintain a certain level of oil pressure to lubricate the crank. And if you don't have the right amount of oil pressure, it won't lubricate properly. So you wouldn't even know if that was going bad. I guess your crank would just go bad or something. I don't know, but <laughs> everything is done. Okay, now I've got all of my center case pieces laid out with the exception of the crank. That's because that's sitting in the freezer right now. Leaving it in the freezer will contract the metal and probably make it a little bit easier for installation. I've also got all of my assembly lubes, my Loctites, my Yamabond, and my service manual all laid out and ready to go for assembly. Now we're gonna start with the left case half. I've got it facing down here. And the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna put in the crank. The crankshaft on the Raptor 660 is a sweat fit. So it's not, the uh, bearing actually is nearly attached to the crank. It's such a press fit on there. When you buy a crankshaft, it will come with the bearing on there. And to get it off, you really need a torch and you've got to get it extremely hot. Uh, it's not something that I would do here. So chances are you're probably going to be doing this the same way. So what we're going to do is we're going to put the crank in with the bearing on it. And we're going to try to get it to seat in here nice and easy. If we have to, we'll use a crank installation tool. But what we're going to do is throw this in the oven and get this nice and hot. And then the freezing cold crank will be contracted. This will be expanded. And usually you can get it to just drop right in place. So I'm gonna throw this in the oven and I'll grab the crank from the fridge. Whew, man, this thing is freezing cold. So here is our brand new Wiseco crank, compliments of Rocky Mountain ATV. I'm gonna set that right there and to help facilitate that cold crank going in, we're gonna use a torch with some map gas just to heat up this inner race. And this will expand the metal so with the contracted crank bearing and the expanded cases, hopefully we can just pop it right into place. But if we need to, we have a crank installer tool that'll pull it the rest of the way through. Let's see if we can just get this bad boy to pop right in place. I don't think so. Now we're gonna have to pull it in. That's all right. Come right through the hole in our crank, or our case rather. We're just gonna start cranking on this and it should pull the bearing right into place. Yep, it's already pulling it in and you wanna make sure that your rod is facing in this opening because if it's not, uh, you can actually trap it on the inside of the cases and you'll have to pop your crank out and do this over again. So we're just gonna nice and gentle. And that creaking and popping, that's totally normal. Man, this is a snug crank. All right, I think it's, I think we're all the way home. And the crank is installed. I don't think you could do it without this crank installer. One thing you definitely don't want to do is smash it from the other end. That's a huge mistake that a lot of people make, like first timers and stuff. They'll just go around the other end and try beating it in and then your, uh, your crank is totally out of whack. And the other thing that can happen is guys will take the case halves and try to crush the, the crank into place. And the same thing, it ends up taking the crank and getting it out of true and stuff. So you, you gotta have the right tools to do this. Now we're almost ready to put the other case half on and close out the center section of our crankcase. But uh, the last thing we have to do is put on our oil strainer and the oil cover. The little oil, oil cover is right here. One screw goes right like that, super easy. And then the strainer is gonna go like so. Now this is a little bit tricky because 
the oil strainer under here, you know, you have oil it goes through here and this is going to filter out any kind of, you know, junk in the engine. This one had a ton of junk in it when I pulled it apart. The thing is when this thing gets caked up, really it should be replaced and they don't offer this part anymore. It's a discontinued piece. So I had to pull mine apart and I had to get all of the little aluminum chunks. There was all kinds of RTV gasket maker and stuff stuck in there. And uh, what I did is I put it in some muriatic acid and that will dissolve all of the aluminum. It's some dangerous stuff. You got to wear a gas mask. Be really careful if you do that. But if you need to clean it out, that's a pretty effective way to do it. Essentially, these two pieces pry apart and then you clean it yourself. So this, this will clip together like so. And now it's one piece again. Like I said, this is going to go in place like this. Now, if you have a gasket, the gasket will run all the way across here and it'll do both of these. Now, unfortunately, my gasket kit did not include that. Now, in a lot of cases, like if you're working with engine covers and stuff, uh, you need to put a gasket in there because they, the tolerances of the internals actually account for the thickness of the gasket. In a scenario like this, I don't think it's absolutely critical to have that gasket in there. So I'm gonna put a little bit of Yama Bond on there, some RTV, and we'll use that in its place. All right, both case halves are coated nice and evenly. Uh, if you're working with this stuff, realistically, you've got like 20 minutes. So if you screw up or something, or you're taking a while, don't rush. You can let it, it can dry a little bit, you'll be okay. 20 minutes is a pretty good amount of time. So we're gonna pop this right in place. Um, hoping that it will just slide right on, but we might have to use the crank puller on this side too. Uh, you just don't wanna wedge it on there and start beating it with a hammer. Oh. I almost forgot my dowels. Almost forgot. So close. Oh, is that it? We're there, man. We are there. Nice and easy install. All right, now I'm gonna run the case bolts in. These uh, Alley bolts kits make it really easy. They come in kits with, uh, this was like a, I don't know, 700 piece kit, and they're all labeled like this, case bolts. So I know they're all right here. And I don't have to worry about, you know, sifting through a whole bunch of bolts or refinishing the OEM ones. And uh, OEM fasteners from Yamaha notoriously are not the greatest. Now, one thing is you do want to use anti-seize on these because these are stainless steel going into aluminum and they can actually oxidize and then become very difficult to remove. So don't forget to say, uh, use some anti-seize on these. Now I'll run these in with the impact on a very low setting. This Milwaukee M12 is perfect because the lowest setting only goes to maybe five foot pounds of torque. So it's really hard to strip these out or over torque them. But these just make it really easy to bring them in. And then I'll go back over with a torque wrench when I'm done and I'll torque them to about seven and a half foot pounds. All right, these are all torqued and good to go. Some of these will be getting stays, little wire stays and stuff that go underneath these bolts. But I like to wait until the end when it's in the machine and I can just back these back out, put the stay back on there and put it back in. For now, we're good to go. We're gonna let the gasket sealer dry. You could wipe it off the outside, but I find it easier to let it dry for about an hour or so. And then you can just scrape it and it peels right off. It's really clean and easy that way. You know, honestly, that went together pretty easily. Did you ever think that the ASPCA Raptor engine was gonna look like this. I know I didn't, man. This thing is like ultra clean. I mean, dude, I love the blackjack coating on here. It just looks so good. We've got the fresh bearings and whatnot, man. Got the Wiseco crank. I just can't wait to see this engine all together, man. I like this is this is gonna be pretty trick. I'm pretty stoked for this. Me, man, really? Are you fing kidding me? <sighs> Doing this three, four times trying to get a good shot. And that little spring just went into the bottom end. God damn it. Kind of tough. The 
But because of the design of the pressure plate on the 660, we can only get away with getting rid of one of the half plates. If you look at the underside, the inside of your pressure plate, this is what contacts the top um, fiber of your clutch pack. If we were to go with the full fiber and put it on here, it won't fit. You can see the gap there. It just, it won't straddle this inner raised portion. If we take the half plate, you see it goes around it and it lays nice and flush. So unfortunately you do have to run at least one of the half plates at the top of the pack, but we will be getting rid of the other half plate and the judder spring that goes in the beginning of the clutch pack. All right, this engine's actually coming together pretty nicely. Like, I would borderline say easily. Uh, we're about to do the flywheel here, but if you guys remember, I've got two holes here, this upper one, and I believe it is, yep, this one right here. They are stripped out, so I don't want those to be stripped out anymore. So my helicoil kit came in the mail. It's just a cheapie from Amazon. Thread repair set. Read user instructions carefully before installing. Operating, serving, and repairing this, or repairing this tool. Anyways, uh, this is a metric kit. It's uh, cheap, but honestly, these things should be just fine. They're stainless steel inserts, and I got lime green because lime green is just cool. All right, I should be able to knock this out without too much carnage. I'm actually not that well-versed with helicoils. I've done like maybe two in my entire lifetime. That's why I didn't even have a kit. Uh, but you know, it's a small thing, and there's it's not like a high torque area where things need to be perfect, so it's not that serious. It's not that serious, all right? So um, we've got a pretty good you know, a uh, pilot hole basically. So I don't think I need to like put this in a jig or a drill press or anything. I'm just gonna blow the bit straight through <laughs> and pray for the best. Well, not straight through. I don't wanna knock the back out, but um, let's just go for it. I'd say that's just about it. Looks good to me. Try to keep this clean. Keep the engine chips out of the engine. I should probably throw a rag in here for this opening. There we go, a set of old under trunks. That'll do it, perfect. All right, now we've got the tap. This is a special tap just for the helicoil. It's oversized, just slightly. I'm just gonna ease it in. That'll about do it. Looks good. All right, then we've got all these, these little bastards here. These are M6 by one. This whole kit is just metric. And you can see there's a little tang on the back. And the tool's gonna grab onto that and let us spin this in. This is the tool. That will pop onto the tang, like that. I don't think you actually need this, but I'm gonna put a little bit of Loctite on here because I don't want it, you know, backing out on me or something when I'm threading the actual bolt into it. And then this should just spin right into place. And I'll do it just slightly under. I threaded it maybe one and a half turns beyond. And then we just have to break the tang off. You got a punch, and it's supposed to just break right off. Yep. There we go. And then I either like a magnet, or I'll see if I can get it out of there with the compressed air, that tang. I think I got it. So there it is. That's a completely repaired thread, and it's probably stronger than the other ones because it's steel now. Let's do the same thing to the other one. That was, that was pretty damn easy. Ah, oh, hell, we'll give it a test fit while we're at it. Oh, man. Oh, man, like that of butter. That's perfect. It's even better than it ever was. I didn't even realize that it comes with its own punches. Like, each one of these has its own punch that's just the right size. It's pretty nice.
I wanted to stop to thank you for making it this far into the video. I also wanted to thank the companies that are making Project ASPCA Raptor a possibility. As you can see, it's in need of a lot of help, and without these companies, I think she'd be left for dead. Thank you to Rocket Ron Suspension, Rocky Mountain ATV, DRW Performance, Power Sports Nation, Ramosi Throttles, Bonehead Performance Coatings, Full Flight Racing, and Kenda Tire. These are all companies I trust, and most of them I use on a regular basis. Company links and discount codes will be listed in the description below. If you're enjoying the video so far and looking for a way to help out, giving the video a thumbs up, leaving a comment below, or subscribing to the channel all help out a ton. Products and tools in the video are listed in the description below, and purchasing from those links does help me out a lot. I get a small kickback from that, and there's no extra cost to you. Voodoo Banshee t-shirts and hoodies are now available for sale. The link for that will also be in the description below. And if you're looking to support the channel even further, there is the option to join. All channel members get guaranteed responses to their YouTube comments. All right, guys, I am done talking. Let's get back to the video. All right, now we're going to put the flywheel on, but before I do that, I've broken down the starter clutch and everything because this is actually a pretty common problem with the Raptor 660 where the starter clutch goes. You'll have issues where it'll turn over sometimes, then stop turning over, but the engine is still whining. The starter, you can hear the starter going, but it's not chugging over. It'll do it intermittently, get worse and worse, and eventually the starter, will, you'll, hear the, you'll, hear the, you'll hear the starter motor go, but the engine is not turning over, and that's because this one-way bearing right here, or also known as the starter clutch, just went bad. It's a cheap part. You can get them for probably like 15, 20 bucks on eBay, and you can test them out too. So they fit into this weight. They, this goes on the back of your flywheel, real easy, like so. And then it's gonna get bolted right on the back of your flywheel. So something else that happens with the Raptor 660, it's usually after people start modifying them, is the, the six bolts that hold this in place will shear off. Now one of mine was actually snapped when I pulled this engine apart. So I extracted that one and I went ahead and got all brand new bolts right from Yamaha. And we're gonna go ahead and bolt this plate on and I'm gonna show you how to test the starter clutch as well. Now it's really important that you make it so these bolts don't back out because for some reason a lot of guys have issues with these things backing out they either snap off or they back out or some of them back out and then the remaining ones snap off because they're just not strong enough to hold it so before i thread these in it's really important that all of these holes are clean if they're filled with oil or grit or anything like that but a specifically oil you want to clean it out get some brake clean carb cleaner, uh, shoot it in there, and then blow it out with some, some compressed air, because we're gonna put some Loctite on there, and you wanna make sure the Loctite does its job. And if you have oil and stuff in there, sometimes Loctite just doesn't work. So we'll put this in place, get those holes lined up, kind of fits into a groove. And now we're gonna put our new hardware in, and we're gonna use Loctite 272. This is a high temperature red Loctite, and we're hoping that we never have to take this off again, not until the starter clutch goes bad. So I put a good amount on these bolts. I do not want them coming out. And if you need to get these off, you can. You can always heat them up with a torch and you can break them free with an impact, believe me. They will come out. A lot of people think red Loctite is like impossible to remove. It's just very difficult. I'm gonna start these down with the impact. Now we're gonna to torque these down to 12 foot pounds. This is one of those things I would definitely go to the torque spec because it's one of those weird spots that, you know, it's just common where there's issues. Before I do that though, we can test out the starter bearing. So this will slide right in place like so, and it should only spin one way. So you see this spins nice and free when it's going that way. And then when you go the other way, it does not want to spin. So that means this starter gear is good to go. You can put a pretty good amount of pressure on this just with your hands. And if you feel it skipping or like it wants to slip, then you want to go ahead and replace this bearing right now. Cause it's really, like I said, it's an inexpensive part. When everything's apart, it's super easy to do. Ooh, that looks possibly bent. Ooh, we just have to see how that affects the gear. Might not be a problem. How the f did that happen? You know, probably someone tried to remove the flywheel by pulling on this gear, which is not the right way to do it, and they bent it. You can see it's slightly bent. I don't think it's gonna cause any issues because it really doesn't turn over that quickly when, when you're starting. I'm gonna see if it runs smoothly with the starting gear, and if I think it's gonna be an issue, I will replace it but for now i'm just going to move forward because i want to get this done i can always switch this out later i think we'll be okay though
I don't see any interference or drag on this starter gear. So I think we'll be okay. I don't know if you guys can see in there, but it looks like we've got good contact with the gear on the full revolution. It's not like it's hanging off the backside or something at certain portions where I'd be worried about breaking a tooth. I'm just gonna send it. I should know better than to think things are going well because whenever stuff is going well, that's always when shit goes wrong. I ordered the wrong piston. Yeah, so if you guys remember, uh, I had two cylinders with this machine. It actually had a niche cylinder on the engine and then I got an extra set of, or a box of extra parts with this thing. And that's where the OEM cylinder was. So, I mean, dude, I'm always gonna run OEM over aftermarket. Honestly, uh, I've heard good stuff about niche, cel niche cylinders. I've used them on other machines. I think I've used one on a 400DX, had no issues at all. But uh, I guess, you know, I measured all the specifications and stuff on the niche cylinder, which I actually sold that on eBay. So I don't have that anymore. And that was like brand new, had the cross hatching in it, measured perfect, had a new piston and everything. But I wanted to use the OEM one. And uh, I guess I just went off the measurements of the niche one and I was getting the OEM piston. Uh, or OEM size anyways, so I got the regular stock bore piston and it's just totally out of spec. I think this was originally <laughs> the OEM bore, but it's just so tired. It's outside of the service limits by a pretty large margin. I went to measure the ring gap and the ring gap is freaking huge. So there's a couple different routes I could go here. I could order the oversized piston and then bore this cylinder out. I could order another niche cylinder. I could get a new OEM cylinder, aftermarket, whatever, that comes with a piston. I don't have to worry about it, but I already went through the trouble of getting this thing powder coated. It looks beautiful. I extracted that one busted bolt in there that took forever. I feel like I've just put way too much work into the cylinder to abandon it. So I wanna use this. I think it's gonna be, the, the best route here is gonna be to get a new sleeve and I'll sleeve this. I'll get the OEM bore. It should fit this piston perfectly. Then I don't, I don't have to worry about sending this piston back or anything. And it's pretty affordable too. I actually already ordered the sleeve. It was like 108 bucks shipped for a brand new LA sleeve. Now I'm gonna try something here. I've never done this before, but apparently I watched some videos online of guys re-sleeving these things themselves at home. So <laughs> we're gonna try it out um, and see what we can do. Should be a disaster. Here's the cylinder, the beautiful cylinder I put all this time into and just didn't even check the bore. But anyways, uh, yeah, I went ahead, I had this freshly honed and everything and just neglig neg negligence on my part. I, I don't know why I didn't measure this stuff before. Anyways, uh, here's our piston and I'll show you, man. It is, it's got a little bit too much play in there. I went ahead and measured the bore and like I said, it was out of spec. And check this out. I'm gonna throw one of these rings in here and I'll show you guys the ring end gap is just way too much. Push that in place like so. Now if everything was right, we'd be looking for about 16 thousandths for our piston ring end gap. And uh, yeah, little bit out of spec by like five times. You could probably fit five of these things in there. So we, we, gotta, get a, we gotta get that fixed. So I hopped online and I saw some videos on YouTube. You know what they say about those YouTubers, man. You can never trust them. But I hopped on there and I saw videos of guys literally doing it in their backyard. Uh, they throw it in the oven. Uh, pretty much everybody across the board. And I did some research reading on a couple of technical websites about uh, sleeve doing sleeves and whatnot. And it says it looks like 350 degrees is the magic number to get the sleeve out. So I saw people doing it, like I said, in their backyard, throwing it in the oven and then knocking it out with like a block of wood and a mallet. So... Anyways, I'm gonna try it out. So I have the oven preheating to 350 degrees and I have this small piece of steel that fits across the bore almost exactly. So I'll shave up the edges of that to make it fit the cylinder. And I've got a 12 ton press. So instead of using the mallet and stuff, I'll try it in the press. We'll see if we can just press it right on out and make it really easy. And then for putting it in, supposedly set it up to 400 degrees the aluminum block, and then we'll freeze the cylinder just like we do bearings. And sometimes it just literally drops right in place. If not, we have the press and we'll be able to press it in. I don't think it'll be too bad. And uh, it'll probably be a disaster like I said before.
Why, hello there. It has recently been brought to my attention that I have multiple parts stores on Facebook. Yes, it would seem that people have taken it upon themselves to open my own stores using their accounts and scamming people and selling fake parts. This is really old news, especially if you follow me on Instagram. There has to be, I don't know, like 40 or 50 fake profiles using my identity to sell parts and scam people. Uh, but this one, this, this one was a good one. I, I, was, I give this dude props for the effort. So uh, a bunch of people sent me DMs uh, telling me that this profile was up, asking if it was me. A bunch of people said they had already been scammed and they knew it wasn't me. But I just had to show this. So this guy, he's using my pictures and he's got it. It's called Michael's Spare Parts for Sale. He's got a picture of me with my YouTube logo sitting on the old school banshee as the, um, the backsplash. And then he's got a picture of me open up the ASPCA Raptor parts as his profile picture. And uh, he's got these parts for sale. I don't know if they're legit or not. They might be legit and he's just using my identity. But what, what makes this alarming is the, uh, the interactions with the guy. So this was sent to me by a subscriber. He was DMing the guy back and forth. He says, I guess he was trying to work out uh, something for a part. He says, address, email address, phone number, names. We'll be needing that for shipments. And then my subscriber says, and another question, why are you using Michael Sabo's pictures? So the guy goes, he's my boss. I work with him. So the other guy goes, oh yeah, how is that? I work with him. By the way, he's my cousin. You know, you know him? And he said, I would think if you worked with him and he is your cousin, he would know who you are. And then... He says, you can ask him, Brian, you can ask him, Brian, I'm Brian. I have seen his YouTube. Yes, he has a YouTube channel. This is his Facebook page, I control. Any problem? I don't, ha I don't have a problem, but I'm willing to bet he doesn't know you. Okay, if you, feel so, if you feel so, then why are you trying to buy here? You can go elsewhere then. And then my guy says, seeing as I texted him last night a pic of this page and he got, a, and he got on a lot of your posts and warned everyone you're a scammer. So, I mean, I, I didn't know I had a cousin named Brian, but apparently I do, and uh, I employ him to sell my parts. So here's from another subscriber. I don't know what the text feed is before this, but I guess he had already called him out for being a scammer. He says, I did not scam anyone and I don't scam people. Then it says, must have seen it before you remove the comments. And you, don't, and you do not know Sabo. So I had actually gone on the page and blasted like every comment just saying, this isn't me. This is a scam page, he's using my pictures. I commented on like all of his parts on the page and he went ahead, he just deleted all of them. He says, I get many clients every day on my page and no one ever complained of me scamming people. So one person will comment on my post about a scam and you believe I scammed him, LOL. People are already, people already bring you down at a time. So that's a reason I deleted them. He says, when you steal pictures from someone else, yes, I do believe them. And then you can see that he got blocked. So it seems that's the theme here. As soon as he got, he got called out, uh, he just blocks them. So after I posted a bunch of comments saying that uh, this wasn't my page and everything, he sent me a DM before I could even DM him. He said, did I scam you broke ass bitch? And before I could even get back to him, he, uh, he blocked me. But all I said was greetings, fellow citizen. What seems to be boggling you? No greetings. What seems to be your boggle? My boggle? How much do you weigh? Well, I happen to weigh for six. Oh. 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 I was just trying to have a regular conversation with you guy. I don't know why he had to block me and call me a broke ass bitch. So it looks like he's since deleted my pictures and he's changed the page name to Hardison's Spare Parts for Sale. And probably after this video, he's gonna change it to something else. But uh, the point is, I don't know if these parts are real or fake, but anybody who interacts this way with people and is trying to deceive people by saying that they work for me or something like that, I wouldn't trust any parts from this dude. So <laughs> I just wanted to point it out. I think it's hilarious. I love that you guys uh, send me these things. I get them every single day from different scam pages. So just watch out guys, don't fall for scams. As far as used parts go, uh, the only place that I sell my used parts is in my eBay store. I don't do stuff on Facebook. If anything, maybe on Facebook Marketplace, I post, post up a quad, but I usually do giveaways now or I don't even have to do that. If I make a post, I, you guys usually, somebody comes to me and wants to buy it. I don't, I don't really have to do stuff like this. So don't fall for that stuff. This is my actual Facebook page. I don't even have a profile picture and I don't have a, a backsplash either because I don't really use Facebook. And um, I have a fan page too that I put up uh, years ago. It's inactive. This is what it looks like. You guys can see the page. It's actually my old logo. It's my face, but if you look in the background, it's got the old logo. It doesn't have Basket Case Garage. So this is the guy going around on Facebook pages blasting the Michael Sparrow Parts page, Joe Marriott. I don't know if that's the actual guy or not or another fake page or maybe it's my cousin Brian. I don't know. Um, but yeah, uh, it seems that this is the only way that I can get through to people because like on Instagram and on Facebook and stuff, 
people will be like, oh, is this you, dude? Like somebody using your profile. I'm like, no, it's not me. It's a scam. And they're like, oh, how do I know that you're not the scammer? And he's the real Mike Sabo. Oh, my God. So, dude, like, I don't, I don't f- know. And if I ever am really selling something on Facebook or Instagram, if you're a serious buyer, I will video chat with you so that you know it's legit. Don't fall for these pages. <sighs> All right, I left this in the hour for an oven. Did I really just say that? I left this in the oven for an hour. So we should be good to go. Prop this up on these boards so that the sleeve can press through. Oh, I can see it's moving already. Woo, that is hot. Man, the heat transferred really quickly. All right, now we'll try our super special custom piece. Oh yeah. Perfect. You can feel it getting easier the further that it goes out. And I guess it's got less resistance. You know, short of making a better jig, ooh, <laughs> I don't really know that it could be any easier than this. Check it out, man. I just went and had lunch for like 45 minutes and this thing is still warm. I can't believe it, but that popped out really easy. I don't know what the deal is with like, it looks like rust. I wonder if they press these in or whoever pressed this in. I don't know if this is the original cylinder or not. I'm gonna guess that it is. I don't see any markings on the outside. I think LA sleeve has a brand on the outside, but maybe not. Uh, but regardless, I wonder if maybe, you know, if this was in the freezer and then they pressed it in, it's sweat on the inside and that's what caused the rust or if it's from, I, I, I don't know, but um, I'll probably be able to clean that out and I'll get this thing prepped and ready for when the new sleeve comes in. This is just paint from one of the boards that it was resting on. It like bubbled up because it was so hot and stuck there. So I'll just resurface that. And it's kind of nice too, because now I can resurface the bottom of this. Normally that sleeve is sticking out and I can't get that. So this, uh, the cylinder will be freaking brand new when it's all said and done. So we're on hold yet again, I know. Mike, when are you gonna finish the Project Raptor? Oh. It's been a long one, man, but it's gonna be really good. We gotta wait for that sleeve to come in, but before I end the video, I got some cool stuff that I wanna show you guys. Actually, we're gonna do this one last. Let's do the game on first. You guys know what that means. Game on is my suspension from Rocket Ron. Let's crack this open. This, uh, I haven't looked at it yet. I wait for you guys. This stuff has been sitting here for a while, man. I, I wanted to open it on camera, but I have a feeling these are gonna look freaking sweet. These are totally custom for this specific Raptor. Oh, dude. I can't see them, they're in bubble wrap, but I can tell. These are gonna be hot. Oh yeah. Check that out. Man, I don't even know if this stuff is gonna fit in the frame. These are some this is some long ass shocks, man. These are from YFC 450R. So these are gonna be custom for my Raptor. They're like a long travel option, but they're a custom long travel. So long travel for the Raptor 660, I believe is 18 and a half inches eye to eye. So these are 18.25, 18 and a quarter inches. So it's a little bit shorter. I had the A-arms custom made from full flight to fit these shocks perfectly. I think that's a really nice upgrade because whether I keep this or if I decide to sell it, if anybody decides to do anything with the suspension, they can do YFZ 450R stuff, which is a currently produced machine. It should just, it should just make things a lot easier. Plus I told Rocket Ron the color scheme and you can see he's got the battleship gray here, another gray here and the gold. It's gonna match the build really nicely because we've got that same color on the frame and then we've got the bronze on the engine. So this should look really, really good and flow nicely. And then this shock looks freaking amazing. Rocket Ron colored the uh, shock body. Got a new bumper in there, dual rate spring. I just have to put in the uh, bearings in the top and bottom, which I have. Uh, this is a regular Raptor shock for the rear end. So we didn't go long travel on the back end, but the way that Ron builds these things, this thing should be a really smooth ride. Now I'm good with a lot of stuff, but suspension, I leave to my guy, Ron. If you're looking to have any custom suspension done or just have your current stuff rebuilt, make sure you hit up Rocket Ron and get your game on. All right, now I've got one other thing I can show you guys. Pretty much all the other stuff you guys have seen or you know uh, what's going into this quad. It is the graphics kit. And sad to say, this will be my last kit from AGMX Graphics. 
From what I understand, they are discontinuing their motocross graphics, so nothing for quads and dirt bikes. I hope I'm wrong, but that's what they're telling me. So I'm gonna have to find a new graphics company. But we've got one last set here, and they're freaking sweet. I'm gonna open them up and show you guys. I mean, I've been, you know, sitting, waiting for parts for this machine for a good majority of this build. And there's a big part of me that wants to put the graphics on the plastics ahead of time, but I just can't, man. It's, it's, I feel like it's so epic putting them on very, the very last thing, but I can show them to you so you guys can kind of get an idea of what they're gonna look like. All right, guys, check it out. I thought it would be cool to actually kind of mock it up on the machine so you can see the color scheme and all, and dude, I love it already, man. I can have, this is first time I'm seeing this too. Oh my God. Oh, dude. Oh man, that, dude, it matches the seat cover and everything really nice. Dude, graphics just, they bring everything together. They really do. I can't wait. Now I'm like, dude, get to the finale, man. Put this thing together. I want to see what they look like. That just looks really, really cool. I think I can, I can probably tape these into position. I'm not going to lie. I'm actually kind of relieved seeing this. I was a little bit worried using these old ratty plastics on a complete build. It was going to look like trash, but I think it's coming together quite nicely or it will come together quite nicely. I really, really wanted to incorporate white into the, into the graphics to cover up a lot of the plastics because they're not the nicest plastics. They're, they're, they're not bad, but I mean, you can see up here, some of the stuff I think I can get out with like a magic eraser or just some, some elbow grease, but I really would like to have new plastics on this thing. The problem is I couldn't get new plastics for this thing. I found a number of like, okay used ones that looked like, I don't know, these are okay used ones. So why replace them with that? I'd love to get, if I could get this stealth color, like or like any kind of gray or charcoal plastics, I think it would look amazing. But we got to work with what we got. Unfortunately, the Raptor 660 doesn't have you know, the best aftermarket support or even OEM support I'm, I'm discovering. So yeah, uh, the graphics being on there covers up a lot of the imperfections, definitely looks good. I was a little bit worried that the greens wouldn't match, but uh, the greens match really nicely. I think when they're actually on there, it's gonna look a lot better. I'm just super stoked. We've got all of the sponsors on here. Kenda, Rocky Mountain, Full Flight, Bonehead Performance, Rocket Run, PSN, Hermosi, and DRW. It's pretty nice, man, pretty nice. Man, you can really see what this is gonna look like when it comes together and it's, uh, I'm liking it, man, I'm liking it. So unfortunately, we gotta put this on hold, we gotta wait for that sleeve to come, but it's coming soon, man. In the next video, it's gonna be the finale, I will have that sleeve in the cylinder, the engine will be done. If anybody wants to see a full engine breakdown, I'm gonna do a complete uh, engine build video for the Raptor 660, that will come out after the series, so just hang tight for the Raptor guys looking for a rebuild video. But once that engine is done, all of the other stuff is ready, I've pre-fit pretty much all the parts, so, you know, God willing, this thing should go together really easily. It has to, man, because this was a nightmare project. This is probably this, this is probably one of the worst machines I've ever had. Condition-wise, I think it's, not too many machines have frames in, in condition this bad that can be saved. I mean, I've seen ones that are twisted up and stuff, and I mean, what the hell are you gonna do with that? But this was this was a far cry from a, <laughs> a saved machine, and uh, it's, it's almost saved now. So I'll see you guys in the next video. If you appreciated this video in any way, shape, or form, you got any enjoyment out of it, please consider leaving a thumbs up for the video. Also consider subscribing to the channel for more content like this. If this is your first video, I encourage you to go back and see this quad, how it was in the beginning, because dude, like I said, man, it was trash. We've also got other builds on the channel. We've got Banshees, YZ125, all kinds of other stuff on this channel. So I appreciate everybody. And until the next video, guys, peace out.